Um, next, I'd like to introduce Pascal Finette. Um, he's also our innovation lecture series speaker today that we combined uh, into this uh, whole uh, center presentation. Um, he is the director of Mozilla Labs, where he works with a talented team of engineers on inventing the future of the web. He loves technology and believes internet is deeply impacting mankind. He got started on the net before there was a web browser, founded a couple of companies on the internet, led eBay's platform solutions, uh, but mostly he simply loves to do cool stuff on the web and work with great people. So, Pascal Finette. Thank you. Good morning. Um, let me start it with a, a little anecdote. So I was at the, uh, the Space Center yesterday and got the tour and got to see uh, both the Space Shuttle uh, mock-up as well as Soyuz. And it kind of like made me aware of the fact that whatever Karim showed you and I'm sure other um, speakers today will show you is basically the Space Shuttle, really beautifully engineered, amazing piece of technology. Uh, whereas Mozilla really is more like, a, like Soyuz. So we are flying by the seat of our pants and um, what you're going to see is kind of like, I let you into the secrets of you know, how we engineer and architect this thing, which uh, uh, is Mozilla and is the Firefox web browser, um, but don't expect miracles. It literally is like Russian space technology. <laughs> so with that being said, what I want to talk today about is um, seven insights we had, um, two problems which come with that, and then a little bit talk about the, a couple of thoughts about the future. It should just give you a little glimpse of like, what keeps me up at night. Um, so you heard about me, uh, kind of I'm coming for, for Mozilla, I'm coming from a really weird background. My background is in uh, economics and most of the uh, Mozilla people are engineers, so um, I'm usually like the odd one out there. Um, one thing you need to know, what I'm going to tell you is uh, there's a big warning sign with that. So whatever I'm going to tell you, your mileage will vary. Um, so don't take my, you know, my word as like, this is the way you should go. It is the way it works for us. But um, Mozilla is a very, very unique beast. Um, so take this into account. And let me give you a little bit of context. So Mozilla itself is a, we are a public benefit organization. Um, we are a mission-driven organization. Um, we are a, a community of creators. Uh, and we are probably most well known for producing Firefox and Thunderbird. Um, some people at NASA actually might come across another product we, uh, we happen to build, which is Bugzilla, uh, which NASA is one of the largest uh, consumers of it other than us um, for bug tracking and uh, issue tracking. There is a, an, a different view, uh, and uh, I find this uh, pretty hysterical. Um, so Fox News uh, interviewed John Lilly, our former CEO, uh, and uh, identified us as the uh, search engine next to Apple and Microsoft. So the last time I looked, we didn't do either a search engine nor did Apple. But then, having said that, having our CEO on national television with like holes in his jeans might have tripped the Fox guys. So, <laughs> so it's really important to know, uh, we have a very, very simple mission. It's about promoting choice and innovation on the internet. And really, like, that's it. It's so simple. But if you think about it, the web itself is too important to not have someone as a steward of it who looks after it and, and keeps it as its, its heart. Because the web enables like, so many things, as you know, you're surely well aware of. Um, and there's a whole debate about net neutrality and like, access to the web and bringing web to other countries. And uh, you see stuff like the Great, Wall, uh, the Great Firewall in China and all these kind of things. And we are very concerned about these things and try to, um, to help. A little bit about the Mozilla history. So um, Mozilla is basically the, the successor of Netscape. So you might remember Netscape browser, which was the first like, commercial um, successfully browser uh, back in the day. Um, Netscape didn't do terribly well um, after the initial IPO. Uh, they were bought by AOL. AOL wanted to buy Netscape because they wanted to have the server software. And they ended up with this thing, which was the browser. And AOL really didn't know what to do with it. So, there was a group of ex-Netscape employees who decided that it would be a really interesting experiment to take this Netscape code base and open source it. At the time, that was revolutionary. So nobody had done that before, like take an existing piece of like a million lines of intellectual property and open source it. So there was a lot of resistance. But um, the guys succeeded, and um, they created the Mozilla Foundation, which then became uh, uh, the steward of, of the Mozilla code base. And uh, in 2003, I believe, we um, rewrote the, the, the browser and created Firefox. At the time, it was really interesting because uh, Internet Explorer had a market share of 99 something percent. 
So basically, the internet was you know, done. Uh, Microsoft owned the internet. And the more important thing is that uh, Microsoft at the time decided to divest. They were basically saying, like, it's done. We've, you know, it's fine. So they reduced the Internet Explorer team, the team who worked on Internet Explorer and innovated on the product, to zero. There was not a single person working in Microsoft working on the Internet Explorer. So the central piece of software which allows you to access the Internet had no innovation. And that's clearly not a good outcome. So we were very motivated to you know, do something about that and created Firefox. So Firefox today is um, a, a product which is used by roughly 400 million people. Uh, we are etching toward half a billion. Um, we've got 25% market share global. Um, in countries like Germany, we are now the largest browser. Um, so it's a tremendous success story. The, the more interesting piece about that is that this success story has been made possible by um, currently a staff of only 350 people worldwide. So the, the kind of like the joke is every time I get like someone into my team, I'm like, okay, so here's a computer and here's 1.5 million people you have to be responsible for. Don't screw them up. <laughs> um, the, the, the more important fact is that for, still 40% of our code base is community contributed. Um, so other people other than us write this code. Um, and we've got a huge community around Mozilla. So we've got, um, it, it, there's this, what we call the order of 10. So you've got like 350 people basically on staff. You've got about 3,500, 4,000 people who are hardcore contributors, like writing code. Um, you've got about 40,000 people today who are um, helping us uh, debug this code by testing it um, using our nightly, so the product we release every single night. Um, there's a community of about 400,000 people, which is currently etching toward 2 million people who use our beta products and give us feedback. Um, there's community on Translate, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a tremendously uh, interesting community story. And I'm going to talk about a little bit of how we got there and, and probably what you can learn from it. So with that being said, let's go back to the seven insights and the two problems. So first insight is, um, and this is really, really important, um, at least when you're a software company, um, only superior products matter. So when you look at um, successful companies, they all had amazing user experiences. So you've got Firefox, obviously, but you've got Wikipedia, you've got the Apache web server, um, and even the iPod. When Apple brought out the iPod, there were plenty of MP3 players, but like nobody, nobody actually captured this user um, utility so well. So the, the core message is without excellence in experience and the utility, all the rest is meaningless. This is something which is really important for us like, to eng ingrain in everyone we talk to, because if we are not building an amazing product, we can do whatever we want, and we can stand on stage and tell you about like, how important the web is, it wouldn't matter because we don't have the seat at the table, because we don't have the product there. So the second one is a more an organizational um, part. So for us, what we do is, as you can imagine, if you're only 350 people, you can't have a command and control structure. So what you need is you need to push the, uh, your decision making to the edges. And it's, that's a frightening thing, because you suddenly give people power who you, know, you probably barely know. But it's also very, very empowering. So there's a term coined by uh, Dees Hock. Uh, Dees Hock is the founder of Visa, um, which is called the K-Ord. And um, K-Ords have a, um, a specific uh, set of attributes, um, meaning they have a distributed uh, decision making. They've got something called nodal authority. So you're basically uh, segmenting your decision making into, into nodes, nodes push them out and give those nodes um, authority. And um, there's always routes uh, to um, ways to route around. Interesting enough, and the, uh, the crazy picture you see in the background is a, uh, a mapping of the internet from a couple of years ago. Um, this is exactly how the internet itself works. So if you take one server out of the internet, it doesn't matter. Like the, there's ways for you know, other servers to connect around this. So, um, if you're interested in this, I really recommend this. A, when you go to Wikipedia and look up uh, Dees Hawk, um, there's actually an article, an essay he wrote, um, linked from there, um, about his uh, principles. It's very, very um, uh, worth reading. So the idea is, the term is basically a mixture between chaos and organization, which is exactly how you know, we work. Like, oftentimes, I find myself in, an, in a world where I'm like, oh my god, how did that happen? Because it's totally chaotic, because you have very little control over it. At the same time, by giving the, um, 
giving your decision-making powers to the outside, um, you allow people to be very creative, to root around you, and find their own ways to, to do things. So in Mozilla terms, um, this means we have a very clear, and this is important, you have a very clear understanding of what your core values are. So everyone in the Mozilla community understands what we, are f what we stand for, and we make it very obvious, and we make it very clear, and we talk a lot about our core values. So like everybody's on the same page, basically. Um, we have a system which we call the modules. So Mozilla, the software, Firefox software, breaks down into hundreds of modules, software modules. Um, and the decision-making power lies with the module owner. So if you're the module owner for, let's say, the, the password piece in Firefox, that's how, where you make the decision, which is interesting. So when you talk to someone like um, John Lilly, our, our ex-CEO, um, he will tell you he was like the only CEO in the country who actually couldn't make a change to a button in Firefox. If he's not the, model, the, the module owner, he can be as long, he can be as much CEO as he wants to. The, we give the authority to the module owner. Um, the other thing you find is the moment you, you start like segmenting people is that groups have very, very different ways to work together, and we just acknowledge that. So we just let them do. Instead of saying, like, this is the way you have to work, we just let them work the way they want to work. Um, what you also find is that there's a lot of decision-making then outside of your like, official org chart. So there's this, the whole stuff happens on back channel where people like, decide stuff. Um, and then, as you can imagine, communication in this uh, scenario is essential. Like If you don't communicate, you die. So taking that point, um, the, 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 the learning you have around communication is, A, communication happens anyway. So you can't forbid it. Like, there is no way you can control communication. Um, so you better make sure that it's re reusable, that people can find it, that it's easy for people to do so. And we do this in a whole, uh, in a whole bunch of ways. So um, what we find is, like, people literally communicate in every way possible. So we installed this. I'll give you an, an example. We installed this really nice uh, video conferencing system, um, which allows us to hook our um, central office in, in uh, Mountain View in California to uh, our satellite offices in Vancouver. Um, people like it and people use it, but there's a whole bunch of people who just go on Skype and use Skype video chat because it's more convenient and they can do it in the coffee shop and whatsoever. So instead of us going to them and saying, like, hey, we spent you know, $20,000 on this system, you have to use it, we're like, whatever, use Skype, it's fine. Bill us for the Skype credits. Um, we use a lot of wikis, which have advantages and disadvantages, uh, but they, uh, they tend to work for us. Um, we use a lot of blogs, um, and the, the scary thing for us is, uh, and that's kind of like um, very unique, I guess, to Mozilla, is that not only the information disseminated on the official Mozilla blogs, but even more so the information which is disseminated on people's blog who are in the Mozilla community is important. Um, so there's a thing which we call Planet Mozilla, where we aggregate all these blocks together. It's based, we call it the fire hose. Um, when you subscribe to this thing, you, you really literally get like the whole breadth of the community. And it's really interesting because um, a lot of people um, blog on their personal blogs um, about you know, very specific aspects of the, of the project, and it gets um, pulled up into, into this planet thing. Um, but it's not like in any form you know, edited or... Um, uh, went through the PR machine. So has its advantages. Sometimes you know, like people blow up on the blocks and you have to deal with the outcome. But um, uh, overall, we find that the, the openness of it um, has clear advantages. Um, as mentioned, we use a lot of Bugzilla. Uh, it's our own tool, but um, it's kind of like a love-hate relationship. It's pretty powerful, but it's not super nice to use. Um, we use something called IRC, which is uh, some internet old timers might remember this. This is uh, internet relay chat. It's basically live chat. Uh, and news groups. And then increasingly, we use um, uh, voice and um, uh, video. And the, the picture with the young man with the glued on telephone is uh, actually, this is Mike Belzner. He's the head of Firefox. So he's the guy who uh, kind of sits on top of all the module owners. Uh, we bought him a headset recently. Um, the other thing we do is we, we, we get people together. So. Um, as good as we are as a virtual organization, as good as you can be as a virtual organization, we find tremendous value in getting people into the same room. 
Um, and we do this both on like module um, areas, so just getting 10 people together, like work week style, um, as well as like getting the whole company together. Um, as well as getting together with, a, with our community. So one of the big events we do is um, we bring 300, the 350 people staff and 350 people from the community who are like the, the most active community members um, together for a, uh, a whole weekend of basically work and fun. So it's really important to make your communication reusable. So basically um, try to find ways where you can have archives of your communication, where it's easily to search for people, like to, to find stuff um, and uh, make those things public. So with that, this leads into, into the next uh, part, which is a, for us, it's um, we need to make it easy for our community to, to help us. Um, it's kind of like a no-brainer in a lot of ways, but the easier you make it, obviously, they, they, the, the lower you have your barrier for people to, to partic uh, participate. So we do a lot of these things. So we have something like Sumo, which is um, support.mozilla.org, which is our support site, where um, we don't provide support. We have, um, Mozilla has, I think, at the moment, three people who do support. And you can imagine we are not actually doing support, but we are you know, grow growing and fostering a community around this. So if you want to do support for, for Firefox, for example, if you're, if you're knowledgeable in the product, it's really easy to get into this community, get an account, help people out. Um, there is different, um, uh, we have some game mechanics built in, so um, the more questions you answer, the more points you get, the higher you, you climb on the you know, social ladder. Um, as well as we do fun stuff like, uh, we recently launched a project um, which we call the Army of Awesome. Um, so we allow people to basically use the Firefox Twitter account to send uh, tweets back to people um, to help them out. So someone tweets like, oh, my Firefox crashes. And then we allow our community to use our official Twitter account to basically send um, tweets back. And the person uh, in a, a given time frame, I think it's a week, um, who sent back the most tweets, um, we send like a surprise T-shirt which is signed by our chairwoman and stuff like that. Um, we do the same for uh, marketing um, as well as uh, 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 quality assurance. Um, so we create these kind of sub-communities and hubs for these people to get together um, and give them tools. A really powerful uh, example of this is uh, localization. So Firefox today ships in 80 languages. We only produce a single one. So the core team of us only produces the US English version. Um, we have uh, communities basically who um, want to see Firefox in their native language. So you have uh, a really nice example for me is the Catalan community, which is a, uh, so Catalan is a, a sub-language in, in the Spanish uh, region. Um, it's spoken in, in the Barcelona area. It's not a lot of people. It's like 10 million people who actually speak Catalan, or 5 million people even. Um, but they wanted to have a Catalan version of Firefox. So we make it really easy for them to basically come together and translate the product. Um, and now we have a Catalan version of it. Um, which also speaks to the product. So it gives the people like this feeling of, this is my product, it's made for me, it's made by a community. Um, so there's this whole like, um, we often compare it a little bit to the whole food movement. So it's a bit like organic food, basically. You know, like you know where it's coming from um, and it has, a, it has a local quality to it. Um, Increasingly for us, the focus becomes to make these tools even easier. So we find this with the uh, localization. Localization is a really hard topic, actually, um, because you've got uh, issues with like grammar, for example. So you can't not only um, translate strings, but often grammar changes, um, you know, sentence, sentence structures changes. Um, or even if you go into uh, uh, non-Roman characters, uh, so you do have you know, uh, Chinese languages or something, uh, which are written in a completely different way. Um, so we create new tools for these communities to, um, to build. So our focus is increasingly, with the 350 people we have, or the people who work on these pieces at least, is enable people to do stuff um, or be the catalyst for it. Um, this is my preferred insight. Um, surprise is overrated. So one of the, one of the key takeaways for us was um, Surprise is literally the opposite of engagement. You're only surprised by something your community does if you're not engaged with them, if you don't know what's going on. Um, if you increase the inner circle of participation, if you let more people in, if you give peop more people 
an insight into um, what you are about, then you are not surprised by stuff they do. And the, uh, the biggest example for this is um, when we launched Firefox 3 a couple of years ago, a couple of kids in uh, the UK actually created a crop circle. Um, and it's surprising. Like, for some, it is surprising. I mean, we had, like, tons of press, and they were like, oh, my God, like, these people from, you know, these fans do these things. We actually knew about it, because these kids basically got in touch with us and asked us for um, a cat drawing of the Firefox logo um, so they could, like, you know, cut out the, um, the crop field. And we asked them, so what do you want to do this for? And they were like, yeah, we can't tell you. It's secret. Um, but, they, you know, they let us in and into, the, uh, into the secret. And it was a huge success. So um, make sure that you, you include people, that people feel included, that people are part of, the, of your community, of your, of your inner circle. Um, what I found most is, like, you know, my background is commercial, so I worked at companies. And you have got this thing where it's like, you know, this is the company and, like, the community is this thing outside. It doesn't work. You need to have them inside. You need to have them, you know, be part of yourself. Um, which leads us to, the, to my sixth insight. Um, and this is one I feel particularly strong about, especially as I worked at eBay when uh, uh, we were 50 people in Germany and I left them when we were 2,000. So I had tremendous growth. And it was really interesting to me, for me to see uh, when we joined eBay, when I joined eBay, my team, um, we really wanted to change the world. Um, we really saw how allowing people to trade online literally changes their world. Um, and when I left, when we had 2,000 people, uh, and no offense, but it literally became how, mu how much more money can we milk out of these people? So it literally changed. And like, for me, eBay lost its mojo at that point. So it's really important to understand, um, treat the people you work with, the community you work with, as citizens. And citizens have a couple of really interesting um, um, criteria. So citizens are not cons consumers. They are much more than consumers. They're not even bystanders. They're even more than stakeholders in like a commercial setting. They're literally us. If you see your community as citizens, then they become you, and your community is like on level footing with you. The interesting thing about um, citizens is that they actually start to, to challenge your status quo and they help you improve yourself. And this is what we see at Mozilla every single day. Like, the people we work with, the community we, we work with, because we empower them and because we treat them as equals, um, they make our conversation rich. They, they basically come to us and, and give us really valuable advice, um, which has its problem, and we come to that later. But um, it's, it's empowering. It's immensely empowering. So. They, they help us not only like make our products better, it's also important that they make us better, us as an organization. They help us define who we are. So there's a meta insight in this, um, which is basically, and I mentioned this earlier when I said that there, this comes with like a, a big warning sticker. It really is about the, the, the art of figuring out how and where to apply these things. There is no schema um, which you can apply. Um, so. In summary, like the, the seven lessons are build awesome products, because without an awesome product, you have nothing. Um, push your decision ed, uh, making to the edges. Allow communication to happen. Uh, make it easy um, to do the, the important things, um, especially for your community. Um, see surprises overrated, like have people engaged. And um, lastly, like treat your communities as uh, citizens. And with that, um, really try things out. Like a lot of the things we do is we try. Um, in a lot of cases, we simply don't know. And we, we run little experiments. And we, we just throw stuff on the wall and see what happens. As we treat our community properly, I hope, um, we actually get a lot of feedback. So basically, um, in my group especially, um, because we are more on the experimental side, we just throw stuff out. And five minutes later, someone is on Twitter, on email, on news group, and basically saying, hey, this is a good idea, and this is not so good, and so on and so on. It, gives, it is a really interesting, very, very fast cycle. And then um, increasingly what we try to do is we measure where, we, where it's possible, um, which is sometimes hard, uh, because so, a lot of the stuff simply doesn't have a precedent, and there's no like, easy way for us to push this into like, an Excel spreadsheet or something, but we try. So 
Having said that, and I, mentioned, I, I kind of touched this earlier, um, there are some problems. So the first problem I need to mention is uh, the moment you have an engaged citizens, they become noisy. So one of the things you have is, first of all, like, you've got tons of them, right? So the, the big question is, like, every single time you go out to your community and say, like, hey, what do you think about feature X? You get, like, hundreds of opinions. And then, you, like, the proverbial, like, the, the, the best opinion you always get is the proverbial, oh, my mother said, or, you know, my mother can't use that, um, which is fine. You, you just need to, like, tune in and you need to, to, to create a sense of, like, what is the actual important bits out of this? Um, and you can do this by, uh, there's a couple of, of mechanisms. I mean, you can just simply apply statistics against it and say, well, you know, like the loudest stuff is probably the most important stuff. Um, you can apply um, social currency against it. So you can basically say, well, if this person says this, this we should better listen because this person really knows what he's talking about. Um, so there's a couple of ways around it, but it's, it's definitely something which happens. The um, other thing is, the moment you empower your community, your community is literally demanding. So um, this young man there uh, posted a one-hour video telling the world why Mozilla and Firefox is screwed. And it's painful to watch. You know, like, I work there, I watch this, and I'm like, holy crap. But on the other hand, like, 50% of what he says is actually correct. Like, there's a lot of, like, ranting in there and, like, stuff I would dismiss, but there is a lot of good stuff in there. So um, you have to deal with it. Doing this in the open is especially painful, right? So this stuff is on YouTube, so everybody can see it. And like um, this uh, gentleman here is a very well-known and respected person. Um, so obviously, like the, the whole blogosphere and like the tech press like jumped on it. Um, so you know, it comes with a cost, but at the same time, it makes you better. And um, often the community is also contra contradictory. So the last time I looked on, on Google and I looked uh, for Mozilla should. Uh, we had 16 million um, hits, right? So there's a lot of stuff in there. And it's often like, um, what's interesting is like, you often get like totally contradictory opinions. Like someone says like, oh, you totally should do this. And then the other one says, like, oh, you totally shouldn't do this. So again, it's, it's, really inter it's a really um, uh, interesting problem to figure out, you know, whom to listen to and how to, how to get out of there. Um, it's important to note at this point that um, we do not believe in design by committee. So the idea that you can have a democratized design process, we, th we very um, uh, strongly believe is, uh, is a failure, uh, especially if you're doing consumer yeah. software. It just doesn't work um, because you, you become this like washed down product. It's a little bit like um, when you look at, at pretty much any Apple product, when you look at a, a product like an iPod, for example, it has a lot of features it doesn't have. It can't record, it can't you know, do this, and it can't do that. They're very d conscious design trade-offs. Um, and we do the same. So um, we are not a democracy, we are a, a meritocracy. So we, we are a community built on merit. So we listen to the people who've got like, the highest status. Um, highest status comes from being the best in your field. Um, and then basically design our product um, according to those principles. So your community, a noisy community, is, is vital at the end of the day. As painful as it might be and as, you know, as hard it is to work with, um, at the same time, they, they help us. They help us tremendously build our product. Um, so yeah, there's a cost to it, but it's, it's well worth it. The second issue, and this is something we face every single day, and especially my group faces every single day, um, at the scale we are operating in and the, the field we are operating in, there are no maps. There is no precedent. There is no, oh, let's see how X, Y, and Z did that, and we can just copy it. Um, there is no, oh, I you know, call my friends at Harvard Business School and see if they've got a case about something. It just doesn't work. And actually, there, even if there are maps, they're everybody else's maps but ours. They don't work for us because we are so unique. And I believe a lot of the companies even if you think you are very similar to, you know, company X or organization X, you are not. So uh, just because I like this thing so much. Um, when you look at maps, there's, there's, you know, like this is really old maps and has dragons everywhere. So be, be careful when you look at maps. Like they, they often can guide you, but they are not yours. So really for, for us, it's like 
the, the key is you know, defining what you care about, define how you can measure it, and then define what, what the litmus test is. And litmus test is something we do a lot. So even if we can't like, fully measure something, uh, when we run like, any kind of experiment, when we, when we do anything, we basically always define, so what is the expected outcome, roughly, and what is the, the non-outcome? And then basically look at like, how do these, these two stack up. And with that, I want to just go a little bit like, it's kind of like a slight deviation, um, but I want to keep you a little bit in the loop of stuff we are interested in at the moment. So stuff which basically keeps me up at night. Um, and the reason why I say this is, um, even if you, I guess even if you're not like deeply involved in like the browser world as we are, um, you might have seen there's a lot of competition now. Um, Google brought Chrome out, and Internet Explorer is coming out in a new version, which is fantastic. It's exactly what we wanted. We wanted to have a world which has like multiple browsers out there and tons of innovation. At the same time, what I see is, and especially for my group, is the browser becomes less and less a, a central element of um, a, a conscious central element of what you do. It, be, it fades into the background. It becomes this thing which you run and you do your work in all day long, but it's not the centerpiece of attention anymore. So we are really interested in like, looking at what is beyond this browser. I don't think that Mozilla will have five, 10 years from now the Firefox browser as the main thing. Um, we will do other things which are aligned with our mission, and um, uh, this is kind of like some of the things we are, we are interested in. So with that, the, the first like, big thought for me is uh, keeping things open. And we had this, so 10 years ago, we had this, or not even 10 years ago, we had this with Internet Explorer and the Internet. And I see the same thing happening with this wonderful device. So we all have like, you know, smartphones, and a lot of us have iPhones. And as nice as the iPhone is, and as nice as the, the, the new world of apps is we have on the, on the phone, um, it's tightly controlled by a single company. It's tightly controlled by a company which sets the rules of what you can consume on your device and not. Um, the, the, uh, there's tons of stories which go around, like um, there's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning um, animated novel uh, which was uh, rejected in the Apple Store because uh, the Apple, it violated some obscure Apple guideline. Um, the, the other thing, uh, you can't get adult content on these devices, which, you know, I'm not for adult content, but like it's a totally legal um, thing in a lot of states at least. So, you know, why not? There's a whole bunch of things which, which happen on these devices, which I think we need, to, we need to find a counterbalance against. And more and more for me, this becomes, this is the story of this guy versus this guy. And uh, you don't need to know who that is. It's Adam Smith. So the, the question for me becomes, how can we bring free markets? How can we bring the idea of free markets? How can we bring what is good about the web to these device classes? And the iPhone is only like, for me, like the iPhone or Android in this case, um, uh, nearly equally as bad, um, is only like a, a, a piece of the puzzle. Like you will see integrated devices in your phone and in, you know, everywhere these days. I mean, I was at, at Philips in the Netherlands, and they showed me like, their whole lineup of like, uh, consumer electronics, which are all connected. Every single device has got like, a, a computer, a chip, a, a touch screen, and runs a proprietary system, which doesn't allow you to do things. You can't hack them. You can't change them. You can't do anything about them. Um, let's say that's, you know, from our perspective, is not a, a desirable outcome. So the, the other... Um, topic, and I touched on this earlier a little bit, is the, the question of evolving with the web and um, the idea of like, the web beyond the browser. So when you look at the web, like um, this is yeah, the first, uh, one of the first uh, screenshots of the Yahoo homepage you know, 10 years ago. Um, and you look at the web browser. This is uh, NCSA Mosaic, which was the first web browser at the time. And then you look at the web today. I mean, it's this like, wonderful garden of, like, you know, we call it Web 2.0, and it's like these interactive applications and then you look at the web browser as it is today, and this is Firefox 3. Point something, and you put them next to each other, you see that there is not a, like there, there has been a lot of innovation in the core, but the product itself hasn't changed that much. I'm very driven by the idea of like, how do we create classes of products which are much more attuned to how we use the web today? So, and then 
Lastly, there's a couple of other themes, and I, I, I really just want to gloss over them so you have heard them at least, and I've put them into your, into your brains. Um, another really big uh, topic uh, which, uh, which drives me is the question of you and your friends. Um, I'm not quite sure if it's a desirable outcome that a single company, namely Facebook, knows everything about you um, and has like your whole social graph and knows all your friends, um, and there's basically no alternative for you. I have no problem with Facebook. I've got lots of uh, really good friends at Facebook, and I think they're doing a tremendous job. It's an amazing platform. But what I would like to see is for consumers the ability to take my social graph and own it, because this is my friends. It's like my address book. It's like giving someone my address book with like all my friends and all their birth dates and all their telephone numbers and basically say, here, you, you take care of it. That doesn't sound like the future I want to live in. So we're really interested in like, um, ideas around this and kind of like figuring out how can we give the user the control back about these things. You know? And again, I have no problem with Facebook. I just want to get the user back into control. The next question for, for us is the idea of like, do it for me. So we see this um, happening uh, more and more in software technology. Uh, I recently spoke to the Intuit guys. Um, uh, who are very much into this, who basically tell you, well, their ideal world is when you open TurboTax at the end of the, well, at the beginning of the year to do your uh, tax filing, you just press a button and it basically tells you, hey, here's a couple of things I have questions about, but the rest I figured out for you. And I think the, the browser can do a lot. So the browser, as the central piece of technology which you take with you every single day, sees every single online interactions you have. So the browser should be able to basically help you uh, and guide you, right? So one of, the, one of the things I find still tremendously frustrating is I go to, a, I go to a, let's say, Google, and I search for something, and I search for a car, and the browser has seen that I only look at Mitsubishi cars. I get search results from BMW. I don't care about BMW. The browser should be able to basically guide me and say, hey, you, you only looked at Mitsubishi cars the last you know, 14 days, do you want me to help you construct a search term which weeds out all the BMWs? Um, there's a whole bunch of things the, the browser can do for me, like data entry, for example. Like, it still kills me that I go to a form and I need to, to sign up for a user account and a password. I mean, the browser should do that for me, and please keep the password secure on the browser. Right? So there's a whole bunch of these things. And then lately, uh, lastly, um, and this is related, the, the question of the data economy so um, we want to put people also into, back into control of their own data, but also help them do something meaningful with their data. So again, as the browser sees every single online interaction you have, the browser can give you pretty interesting insights into um, your usage pattern, um, but also allow you to, on your own terms, share this data with other people. So there's interesting stuff around, um, say, you found a website through a, a specific way through the internet. And you could share this piece of information with, uh, with other people. Um, or stuff like, you are on a website, and 20 of your friends have been on that website as well and have done interactions. We could surface this information and basically tell you, hey, this is a website which a lot of your friends also visit. Um, or even simpler. You come to a website which, um, where you get the, uh, the 404 message, so the website is gone. The browser could basically go out and in, a, in a swarm movement and say, hey, 15,000 other people also have this problem, so the very most likely the website is really down, and it's not your internet provider who's blocking the website, for example. So there's a whole bunch of like, little pieces and things you can do. And with that, I leave it there. Um, if you're interested in, in being in touch, uh, you get me at pfinet at mozilla.com um, or on Twitter at pfinet. Um, and I would love to you know, help you. If, if you have any questions ever about like, how to build communities and run communities, um, I'm super happy to help as much as we can, obviously, um, given the fact that we are very unique. And it, everything we do comes with this like, big sticker, like, your mileage may vary. Thanks.
Thanks, that was in many ways really exhilarating, but maybe it's as a function of my age. What I really worry about is privacy and the abuse of information. Mm -hmm. And you know, how, how do you balance those? And where do you see the biggest potential lesions coming? And you know, this I think is part of the management of the kind of open innovation and the kind of community that you're talking about. And I'm not talking about how to be paranoid about it, but how to be sort of appropriately um, watchful and judicious about building in the controls. Right. Uh, yeah, privacy is, is something which is very close to our hearts and very core to what we do. Um, so uh, first of all, like the, the, the interesting thing about Mozilla, well, the Firefox web browser, I should say, is the Firefox web browser is the only browser which we call it reports to, only to you. So we don't have a commercial interest in your data. So uh, we, we truly have the user's interest at heart. Um, in terms of privacy, I think we are we are currently pushing the boundaries quite a bit in terms of like trying to get the, we see this as kind of like as a pendulum, and it's swinging a little bit too far to the, to the lax side where you know, people are often not aware what happens with their data, or um, even if they are aware, they, there's basically no alternatives for them. Um, we see this, um, I mean, very prominently happened with Facebook, um, Google is kind of like on the, on the brink of it, like especially in Europe, about their um, Street View service. Um, so we, we try to have a voice in these things. Uh, we try to build in controls into the browser, which basically give you these controls back. At the same time, we work with a lot of these companies, like Google and Facebook, um, to basically create uh, mechanisms which give a little bit more control back to the user. Um, it's, a very, it's, a very, it's a tough topic, because at the same time, um, sometimes you find yourself in a, um, at least we at Mozilla, um, we find ourselves in a, uh, in a situation where um, you're a little bit like the, uh, the parent, where you basically go to your child and you're like, no, you can't do this, right? Though the child wants to do it. And it's kind of like you come to this position where you're like, so where, where does our responsibility end? Um, and you know, how far should we, should, should we bring things? Like, should we protect the user against his will, basically. Um, so it's a fine balance. It's something we are trying to figure out. There's a lot of debate currently going on at Mozilla about um, how do we do this properly and the property. It's not easy. Uh, so the question was, is it too late? I don't think it's too late. I think it's, it's um, so there's, a, there's an interesting notion um, which I recently read. So I lived in the UK for a little while. Uh, and uh, I recently read about UK politics. So um, I don't know how, my, how familiar you are with like, their uh, CCTV um, craziness. Um, so I lived in London, which is the city with the highest uh, density of CCTV camera, which really bugged me. Um, and they, uh, they, the notion is that once you have pushed the boundaries, even if you take the boundaries back, you will never take them back to like, where they were originally. You'd only take them back a little bit. Um, and this, uh, in this particular incident, it was about the, the governmental uh, reaction. So what you currently see, I think, with a couple of internet, larger internet companies, they are um, purpose, I believe, they're purposely pushing the boundaries as far as they can, then take it back a little bit, because this, this gives them more leeway than if they would have done it you know, like in, a, in a more subtle way. Um, it certainly doesn't help if you have someone like uh, Eric Schmidt from Google on national television basically tell you that if you don't like Street View, you can move. Um, or if you, if you don't want to have anything on the internet to be a peer, don't do it in the first place. I mean, all these comments are just like, I don't want to be their PR department besides. But, um, so is it too late? <sighs> it's a good question. Um, I don't think so, but I also think society starts to change. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the interesting comments I read, um, I think in the Wall Street Journal, was about um, how today kids don't get jobs because they have uh, inappropriate pictures on their Facebook profiles, you know, of them you know, being young and puking, uh, half naked and puking. Um, that problem will self solve itself in like five to 10 years because the people who hire them will have the same pictures, right? <laughs> so I think society is changing in an interesting way. I'm not sure if it's a good way, but I think society is changing, yeah. Hi, Rolf Muller. I have a, a, a question because for someone who builds more traditional based companies where you always try to control the chaos, you embrace the chaos. Yes. So it's a very different way of thinking. So that's uh, 
very interesting for me to hear that. But the question is, how do you actually manage this? Um, so which kind of people do you hire who actually have the ability to go through this millions of internet sites, uh, mm -hmm. uh, blogs, uh, email information? Do you read these? Or do you have programs to actually go with search words through this uh, right. overflow of information? That's my first question. Second one is uh, for a company that sounds an incredible business model where you only have th to pay 350 people in order to do an incredible um, probably revenue or build uh, a, a company with, which creates the value. And the third one, if you are an unemployed programmer, um, so, well, is it something which you're actually driving a unemployment or you don't provide actually uh, employment and revenue to the people who have the skills. So that's the other part. I'm always very um, um, very proud of seeing people, you know, the parking lot is filling up, people I, I pay uh, health insurance and I, and I have people who can pay their, you know, their, their food and uh, mortgages. Mm -hmm. So in a way it's a very different business model and there's a lot of questions perhaps that's more for afterwards, but Right. Could you comment on some of those points? Yeah, sure. It's a good. Uh, they're all good. They're all good questions. So let me unpack the. Let me try to unpack the question. So first question was about the, how do we actually manage the, uh, especially information overflow, right? Um, so information overflow is a real problem for us. Um, the the way you manage this in practical terms is that um, you tend to zone in on specific areas you're interested in or you're working in. Um, so I certainly don't read. You know anything which is going on. There's a whole bunch of stuff um, which uh, I simply tune out of. Um, the, the way I do this is like um, I, I, we, we use very simple techniques, so Soyuz again, right? So uh, one of the things we do is um, I personally read um, uh, a lot of my news through uh, filters in Google uh, News. So I let Google crawl the web for me and I, I filter for specific things. So that makes it, you know, digestible. Um, I follow a certain amount of people on Twitter because I know that these people are the people who say things which are important to me. Um, I read a specific amount of blogs and I'm continuously like weeding them out. Um, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy problem to solve. Um, the, especially if you're new to the organization, we find it like you drown. Like a lot of my, my employees when they, you know, like their first three months or something, they drown in information because they really try to get everything in. Um, and then they, they go through this motion of like, oh, I try to do everything, like the fire hose, and then they basically stop anything. And then they realize, hmm, that's probably also not working. Um, and then they tune, slowly start tuning the dials in back to, you know, what is the relevant information for us. Um, and this only works if you trust the people in your notes. So I need to, I need to trust the people like who do Firefox core development that they do the, the right job um, and that they also like kind of like do the right job in in the areas I'm more interested in, um, because I can't, I can't possibly keep up with them. Um, so I, you know, I see these people like every two weeks for, for lunch and then uh, try to give them my ideas and then just let them run with it. Um, your second question was? Savings for the company. So savings for the company, <coughs> yes. Um, and this ties a little bit into your third question, I guess, right? Which is the, the question of like, so uh, how does this pan out on a, on a macroeconomic viewpoint? Um, so in, in some ways you could say that if we would be a commercial entity, um, we would derive value from people working for free. As we provide a public service, and this is how we see ourselves, um, it's, I think the, the problem space is different. Um, so uh, we give away Firefox for free. You don't pay for it at all. Um, and the, the, the revenue we make with Firefox is purely for, uh, for sustainability reasons. So it's not like we're making you know, half a billion dollars. We're making, it's public. We're making about 65, 70 million dollars a year. Um, uh, and uh, pay our staff with that, as well as contribute back to the to the communities. Um, so I think the, the problem space is slightly different. Um, but 
yes, it has, there, there are macroeconomic uh, tendencies. At the same time, I would say, um, we provide an interesting, uh, on the, the flip side of that, uh, we provide an interesting um, value to society also when you look at, um, say, your unemployed programmer who works on, a, on our project, um, gains valuable skills, we give him training, um, he gains social recognition, which often makes his employability um, chances better. Um, so we see this quite a bit, like where people like come into our project, you know, work for like a year or so in the project, then get hired somewhere uh, and do tremendous jobs. So it comes from both sides, I guess. Yeah. This one's not live. Um, I hate to stop, but we've gone, gone for two hours and 10 minutes and we're exactly on time. So um, let me suggest that we go ahead and take our 20 minute break and please come back at 10.30 for the panel and uh, Pascal, there's the networking lunch and lots of time during the day. So Pascal, thank you very much. Thank you.